So historical data there. And today, it's just the, the question, what happened in AD 30? So that brings us to what we're at. What happened <clears throat> in AD 30, uh, within 50 days of the crucifixion? And I'm counting 50 days because the day of Pentecost is 50 days after the crucifixion. So within 50 days of the crucifixion, you have 3,000 believers in the resurrected Jesus of Nazareth. I put 5,000 on your papers, but uh, Peter had given his second sermon in the temple. And by that time, they had 5,000 believers. I don't know if a few days passed in there or a few weeks or months. So to be conservative, I could just say 3,000 because that's how many people believed on the day of Pentecost. And when we get into the individual eyewitness accounts, we know that in the first 40 days, there were 500 people plus the disciples plus the women that testified eyewitness testimony that they saw the resurrected Jesus in the first 40 days. So that's huge. Uh, in 50 days, within 50 days of the crucifixion, there was over 3,000 believers. And so the question has to be, what caused that? What caused that? A person would have to be willing to honestly, wholeheartedly investigate. What caused that? Um, the first recorded death that we know of was six years after the crucifixion. That's in Acts chapter 7, and that was Stephen. Now, other people may have died before that, but the first recorded, we know that within six years of the crucifixion, somebody was willing to die. And what was he willing to die for? Uh, he was preaching that Jesus was the prophet that was promised by Moses in Deuteronomy 18. And then Stephen himself said, I see heaven opened up and I see the Son of Man, Jesus of Nazareth, uh, standing at the right side of God the Father. Interesting that he said standing, because Jesus is usually sitting. So uh, that's a neat little thing. But So Stephen, within six years of the crucifixion, is willing to die uh, for the fact that this Jesus of Nazareth actually resurrected from the dead. So a person has to be willing to look honestly at that. There's a quote <clears throat> down below there, a quote by Edwin Yam Yamauchi, Edwin Yamauchi has got a lot of videos on YouTube. He's a professor of history at Miami University. Professor of history and a Japanese-American historian. So this guy knows his stuff. And he, I'm quoting him, Crucifixion was the most abhorrent fate that anyone could undergo. And the fact that there was a movement based on a crucified Nazarene has to be explained. An honest person would have to be willing to look at how that happened. Uh, what's interesting about Christianity, guys, is the Bible is so full of specific events that it's almost like God welcomes scrutiny because there are so many people that he calls by their full name. There are so many places that he speaks of very specifically, geographic locations, and so many events that Christianity is a religion that you can go research and find out the truth of those geographic areas, those uh, first century people, and the different uh, places and cities mentioned. Uh, it's interesting because most religions are based on some kind of a philosophy, but they don't give you a lot of specific events which means you can't really challenge the religion because they didn't base it on any specific events. They just base it on some kind of nebulous philosophies. Christianity is not like that. Christianity is chock full of things that you can go, I'm going to look that up and see if that's true. Pretty interesting. So the first category here, uh, summarizing Jesus' three-year career, Let's look at just the data that we know about his three-year career. The first thing is, could anything good come from Galilee? Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth within a, ta a town called Galilee, in the geographic location of Galilee. And let me just give you a little bit of information on the geography of Israel. Uh, Israel had pretty much three uh, little sections. The first main one was Jerusalem. 
and that was the main uh, part of Israel up on uh, the hills there, and that was where the most elite one percenters were located. Uh, up north of that was Samaria, and Samaria was loathed by the Jerusalem Israelites, <clears throat> uh, so much so that when people would walk to the north from Jerusalem, they would go all the way over to the Jordan River to walk all the way around Samaria. Nobody wanted to have anything to do with Samaria. Uh, in Samaria, they had a copycat religion where they tried to copy Judaism, but they had their own temples, their own festivals, their own priests, separate from Jerusalem, because they didn't want to go down to Jerusalem to celebrate with those Israelites. So there was this mutual discord between Samaria and Jerusalem. Uh, if you go back in history, when the Israelites came back from exile in Babylon and started to rebuild the temple, it was the Samaritan Jews that came and kept knocking down the walls and created war for the Jerusalem guys so that they couldn't rebuild the temple. So a lot of animosity there. Go beyond Samaria and you have Galilee. Galilee was a rustic hick town. That's the way it was looked at from the Jerusalem people. It was looked down upon with scorn and contempt by the more sophisticated Israelites uh, over in Jerusalem. When Babylon returned, when Babylon came in to conquer Jerusalem uh, and exile them, they did it in three waves over 15 years. They took the smartest, brightest, youngest, handsomest people first. Then they came back and they took the politicians and the wealthy and those people next. And then in the third, they took the middle class people. And that third one, when they destroyed Jerusalem, they left the poorest of the poor and they exiled them out to what they call the... Uh, <clears throat> huh? Yeah, I guess there's a name for it. But they exiled the poorest of the poor, the people that, were, that, that weren't even worth taking back to Babylon. And they pushed them up north into Galilee, and then they transplanted other exiles over there with the Israelites, and they intermarried. So they were considered a half-breed up there, and they were disdained by... Uh, the true Judeans in Jerusalem because they were the poorest of the poor and they had intermarried with other nations. Considered a half-breed. The reason we go into all that detail uh, because Jesus of Nazareth was from Galilee. So part of the information for Jesus is he came from the wrong place, from a place that was despised by the Jews and we can look at a couple examples of what people thought of the place that Jesus was from. Can anything good come from Galilee? John chapter 1 and verse 45. <clears throat> John 1 and 45. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We found the one Moses wrote about in the law, the one that the prophets foretold, and it's Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Nathanael asked. And Philip said, come and see. So we see the Jewish uh, disdain for the Galileans, uh, the people from Nazareth. The next disdain we see is you could tell who they were. A Galilean stuck out in the crowd uh, because of their accent. Uh, oh, I didn't give you the reference there. Um, when the Pharisees were talking amongst each other about what to do with Jesus, <clears throat> yeah, he says, does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? Who was that? That was, uh, that was the Jewish guy that was kind of an advocate for Jesus. Uh, anyway, Cornelius? maybe. Might have been Cornelius. When they're talking about Jesus in one of the Gospels, does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? And they replied, Are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arises out of Galilee. So there is a, a piece of historical data there that's important to us because for Jesus to have become such a 
superstar when everybody had disdain for anybody that came from the place that he came from. Luke 7.52, good job. The next one is uh, Pilate's inscription. Uh, John chapter 7 and verse 18. One of the things that really bothered the Jews was uh, one of the inscriptions that Pilate had written and put above his cross after his crucifixion. Uh, John 7 and 18, they crucified him there with two others, one on either side, and Jesus was in between. And Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross, and it read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read the inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and Greek. So the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write king of the Jews, but only that he said he was king of the Jews. And Pilate said, What I have written, I have written. Uh, Pilate was rubbing it in their face, the way they had treated this man from Nazareth, this man from Galilee. So the odds are totally against Jesus as far as where he came from. The implication was that a crucified man a, a horrible, uh, what was it? It said, cursed was anybody that was crucified. It was an abominable way to die. And number two, such a lowly origin as Nazareth of Galilee could consider him to be a Jewish king was odious to the Jews. They hated the idea of something like that. When Peter spoke, he was accused of being a follower of Jesus because he had a Galilean accent. So apparently if you were a Galilean, you couldn't hide yourself very well. They could tell by your accent and they could recognize you. Uh, the next thing was Jesus pronounced woes um, onto the Pharisees. So when Jesus was preaching, he preached to the Pharisees, the one percenters of the Jews, and he was pronouncing woes on them for having led the people incorrectly. So Jesus wasn't making any Fans. It makes me think of the people now who say, Yeah. Well, and we know, um, remember Jesus said, uh, if they don't believe, and you know, really, guys, that's what takes our study a little bit further than what we need to, but I'm just doing it to put the data out there. But the scripture says, anyone that comes to God can only come to God as a child. What is that text? Uh, Anyone that comes to God must come as a child. Uh, not like a used car salesman that's looking for an argument. It's got to be simple. And then another place he says, um, if they don't believe the scriptures, then neither will they believe if they see someone rise from the dead. So if someone's just not going to believe it, they're not going to believe it no matter how much data you give them. Jesus didn't come from the right place. Okay. Okay. Next was when we look at the history of Jesus and his time on earth, he was despised and he was rejected. Um, I'd read from Isaiah 5, 3, that gives us an account of what Jesus looked like and what people thought of Jesus. Isaiah 53, sorry, I said 5, 3. Isaiah 53, who has believed what he's heard from us and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him. He had no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and he was rejected by men. He was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised. We esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. We esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And upon him the chastisement that brought us peace, by his wounds we're healed. So there was nothing attractive about him, nothing inviting about him. It says that he was like somebody from whom people hide their face. 
You can think back to school. I can think back to high school and remember the people that um, were kind of the outcasts. The people that um, when you had the big assemblies and pep rallies in the gym, it was the people that couldn't really find any place to sit because everybody would have moved away from them if they would have sat next to them. The lunchroom. That's what it says about Jesus. Uh, I didn't document this one, but it also says that Jesus was rejected by the Jews because he was the rock that the builders rejected. John 7, Jesus was talking to his own brothers. Jesus' own brothers didn't believe in who he was. They just kind of thought he was a, a big uh, show-off. And so they mocked him while he was alive. And Jesus responded to them, The world cannot hate you because you are of the world. You're one of them. But it hates me because I testify that its works are evil. So Jesus didn't garner many followers, just a handful of people. And most people didn't like it when he was around because he testified about that which was evil. So that's what people thought of him. Uh, how about the way his career ended after three years of preaching to people? Uh, he was put to death by Pontius Pilate, a humiliating, excruciatingly slow death, and it was a penalty that was specifically designed to be slow and agonizing so that other people would never dare to do what this man did. That's an important part of our historical data. Uh, Roman citizens... A Roman citizen was not allowed to be crucified. Rome would not allow a Roman citizen to be crucified because the death was so horrendous, so morbid, that Rome had rules. And crucifixion was only for the worst of the worst of the worst. And they did it publicly so that everybody could see the person that was crucified and not do what he did. So that's a huge testament to why would anybody want to follow what Jesus said unless his resurrection was true. <clears throat> the Roman means for killing people was uh, beheading them, cutting their head off. So technically speaking, uh, a lackluster career with a bad upbringing, people didn't like him. The way they crucified him was specifically to dissuade other people from doing what he did. And then all of that, um, technically speaking, his death should have been the end of his little plight. Uh, a lot of people acknowledge Jesus, but don't acknowledge that he was anything more than that. Ben Shapiro is a, fa is a, is a popular uh, conservative commentator. And Ben Shapiro said, Jesus was an Orthodox Jew. He tried to rebel against Rome, and they killed him for it. That's the Jewish... Fake news is still good today, isn't it? Oh, my gosh. That's what Ben Shapiro says, that the Jews think about Christ. He just, he tried to rebel, and they killed him, and that's it. End of story. But he's ignoring an awful lot of data in order to make a statement like that. So what was the fallout? What happened to the handful of people that did believe in Jesus? And the answer is absolute terror. Absolute sheer fear and dread over what happened to Jesus. And his little handful of people thought that was the end. That was the end. That's it. And I want to look at that just a little bit. On the night, the very night that Jesus was uh, going to trial, Peter, one of his disciples, wanted to get in close and see what was going to happen to this Messiah. So Peter got in close, and when Peter got in close, people started recognizing Peter as a Galilean and as having been with Jesus. And so Peter could see what was happening to Jesus, and three times people said, Hey! You're one of his followers, aren't you? And Peter was one of the main, main uh, apostles there. And even Peter denied it. And we'll look at the third time that he denies knowing Jesus. Matthew 26 and verse 73. 
After a little while, the bystanders, this is several people ganging up on him, they came up to, to Peter and they said, certainly you two are one of them, for your accent betrays you. They could tell he was one of the Galileans. So he began to invoke a curse on himself and he swore, I do not know the man. That tells you how his disciples felt about what Jesus was going through. It wasn't just uh, Peter that denied Jesus, but Mark chapter 14 tells us that when they saw him being crucified, all, actually it was before that, uh, it was even in the, uh, in the garden when they arrested Jesus, uh, all of his disciples deserted him. And so that's what we have in the disciples. Within six years of the crucifixion, we have uh, the first execution of a Christian. Uh, it was a guy named Stephen. He was a deacon in the church. Uh, it's recorded in Acts chapter 7. And he had been preaching that Jesus had resurrected from the dead, that he was the Messiah, that he was the prophet that Moses promised. And um, the Jewish people got so angry at his message that they began to stone him. And that was when Stephen says that he looked up and he saw the resurrected Jesus uh, at the right hand of God the Father. So within six years, people are now getting killed for believing in this. <clears throat> Jewish authorities, uh, at some point after that, Jewish authorities started giving uh, authority to people to go out and look for Christians and persecute them, imprison them, and kill them. Uh, one example we have is Acts chapter 9. A guy named Saul asks for permission to go out and take care of some of these Christians. So while Saul was still breathing threats of murder against the disciples, he went to the high priest to ask for letters to the synagogue in Damascus so that if he found any men or women belonging to the way, he could bring them back as prisoners to Jerusalem. So in a very short time, a huge persecution breaks out, and the disciples in the midst of this were total despair and loss of hope. We'll see what they thought when they first heard that Jesus had been resurrected. In John chapter 20 and verse 11, when they heard that Jesus was alive and that the women had seen him, they didn't believe. His own disciples did not believe that he is resurrected. Another time, Jesus appeared to two men on the road to Damascus, Mark chapter 16. These two men reported that they had seen Jesus, but the disciples did not believe them either. Peter, <clears throat> one of Jesus' main apostles, uh, gave up and went fishing. John chapter 20, verse 3, Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said, wait, we'll go with you. And they went and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. So here are his apostles, his closest group of people, didn't believe he had resurrected, and they were going back to their old jobs. Jesus' own brothers didn't believe in him. James, it's important to, to note that James was one of Jesus' brothers. We're going to see him a little bit later on. But if we look at John chapter 7 and verse 3, his brothers said, Leave here and go to Judea so your disciples may see the works you're doing. Because no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, go show yourself to the world. They're kind of tongue-in-cheek mocking their brother about being a big show-off. And then verse 5, because not even his brothers believed in him. Mark chapter 16, another appearance. After these things, he appeared in another form to two of them as they were walking into the country. When they went back and they told the rest, they did not believe them. They did not believe them. And there's one other account in Mark 16 where when Jesus finally does appear appear to his own apostles. He's a little bit upset with them. Mark chapter 16 and verse 14, afterward he appeared to the eleven. There were twelve apostles, 
But at this time, there were only 11 because Judas had committed suicide for uh, having betrayed Jesus. So he appeared to the 11 themselves. They were reclining at a table, and he rebuked them for their unbelief and their hardness of heart because they did not believe the ones who saw him after he had risen. So there's not any kind of conspiracy here. His disciples, his apostles, his few handful of followers literally did not believe that he would resurrect from the dead. So this is several. So that's a powerful statement when you read all those accounts that his closest group of apostles, none of them believed that he actually would resurrect from the dead. That's, uh, that's something that needs to be dealt with. <clears throat> And yet, what happens within the first 50 days of his death, a huge movement breaks out. And so what the skeptic has to ask is with all of this information, the terror and the disbelief, the lack of faith, how do we account for the 3,000 that 50 days later are all believers in the resurrection? So we'll take a look at that. Peter had testified to the lady, I don't know Jesus, and he brought down curses on himself because he was terrified that Jesus' fate might happen to him. Peter was a disciple who did not believe when he was told that Jesus was resurrected. He had lost hope and he had went back to his old job of fishing. Then 50 days later, he stands up and he preaches the first Christian sermon and 3,000 people become believers in the resurrection, Jesus of Nazareth. Let me tell you what his sermon sounded like. It's recorded in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, brothers, I may say to you with confidence, the patriarch David that both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and he spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses." Now, we spent all that time talking about the fear and dread and terror of his apostles apostles, and that none of them believed in his resurrection. And yet, somewhere between not believing and 50 days later, something happened. And now Peter, the one that denied Jesus, rejected Jesus, didn't believe in Jesus' resurrection, now all of a sudden Peter is the one that is preaching To the Jews boldly, Jesus has been resurrected from the dead. So a person has to take that data, that available information, and say, what's the best explanation for that? What made Peter change? And obviously the best explanation is the resurrection. But a person will have to put that together for themselves. We're going to look at a, a few of these more next week, but let me give you a couple more here. James, the brother of Jesus. James, the brother of Jesus, we've already seen that James, Jesus' brother, mocked him, said, everybody that wants to get famous goes down to Judea, goes down to Jerusalem. Why don't you go down there and stretch yourself down there? And the text told us because his brothers did not believe in him. James now, as we see him in uh, the scriptures, James now is the one that takes the lead of the church in Jerusalem. James now begins to tell Gentiles that they are included in the faith now, something that a Jew would never have done. But he begins telling Gentiles that they are now part of God's elect. Why would James, a Jew, change his mind and want to incorporate Gentiles into the Jewish faith? That was unheard of. And the next Next uh, aspect of this is uh, what would make Jews 
begin worshiping on Sunday and give up the Sabbath. That's an important piece of data. How do we explain Jews giving up worship on Saturday and starting to worship on Sundays? <clears throat> the perspective held. Uh, let me give you one other. Paul, Paul the persecutor. If you remember when we uh, looked at the, the data there, Paul was the one that asked the Jewish council to give him permission to go look for Christians in Damascus and that if he found any Christians, he wanted to be, be able to bring them back and put them into prison. And so this Paul now turns around and Paul is now giving apologetics for the resurrection of Jesus. If we look at Acts chapter 9 and verse 19, when Paul went down to Damascus to get these Christians and put them in jail, something happened. And Paul tells us, for some days he was with the disciples at Damascus. Immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues, saying that he was the Son of God. All who heard him were amazed. Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of all of those who called upon his name? And he has not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him, but his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, and they lowered him in a basket. What could have caused a man going to Damascus to imprison Christians? And by the time he gets to Damascus, he has changed his mind, and now he is proving to people that Jesus was the Christ. The text tells us it's because he was an eyewitness of the resurrection. Jesus appeared to him, and obviously that's what changed his mind. <clears throat> Fifty days later, we looked at these guys, over 3,000 believers now in the resurrection of Jesus Christ within 50 days. That's a, a historical fact that needs to be dealt with. And what was in store for Christians? Degradation, confiscation of their property, and death. In the uh, history, uh, a guy wrote a, a history of the civilization of the ancient Mediterranean. Volume 2 is Greece and Rome. In that historical account, there are 50 pages dedicated to Judaism and Christianity. And in that uh, historical account, the author cites eyewitness accounts of the resurrection. He tells us that the persecution of Christians continued until around 311 A.D. So 270 years. I put 200. It should be 270 years. Christians continued to be persecuted, their property confiscated, and yet they continued to grow and to believe in the resurrection of Christ. We can get a glimpse at the kind of persecution that these Christians faced. Uh, one of the first century Roman historians was named Tacitus, and Tacitus in his annals wrote an account of a deplorable action that Nero had done uh, to the Jews around 64. It was rumored that Nero had set fire to Rome. We all know historically that there was a fire in Rome in 64. So Nero decides to blame the Christians to get the attention off of himself. So this is a mere 30 years after the crucifixion. And look at what these Christians were willing to go through. <clears throat> First of all, there was an edict that was demanded that anybody that was taken to court was required to offer a sacrifice to the Roman emperor. And if a citizen refused to offer sacrifices to the Roman emperor in court, all their property could be confiscated. So anyone, anyone could raise up a, a, a what do you call, a, a, a libel suit against a Christian, and just that Christian appearing in court and not being willing to sacrifice to the emperor, he would get stripped of all of his possessions. Uh, let's see what I had here in this little quote here. 
Uh, Ancient Greece and Rome, Volume 2, page 1065. In Asia Minor, there was an instance in which the entire population of one town was executed. That's the uh, photocopy you have there. Uh, I'm on page 10. That photocopy that you see there, that's, and that's, uh, that's in a uh, historical collection, Civilizations of the Ancient Mediterranean. And so he is accounting for us what happened. Now, Asia Minor, do we know what book was also based in Asia Minor? Seven churches in the province of Asia Minor? Revelation. Revelation. So he's giving us an account directly from Asia Minor. In Asia Minor, there was an instance in which the entire population of one town was executed. In Syria, according to the report of Eusebius of Caesarea, civil life broke down completely. Christian women were forced to serve in brothels. Many men were sent to work in the mines. And when they say, when Paul tells us that he was exiled to the island of Patmos, Patmos had a mine on it. John, thank you, sorry. John exiled to Patmos, uh, historically says that there was a mine on Patmos and that Paul was sent to work the mines. So he's very likely one of the ones that fell in to this situation. So as we look at all this, the persecution uh, that these people endured, you know, I forgot, I skipped one. <laughs> on page nine there, guys, Tacitus, the one I started with and I forgot to read it. Tacitus tells us of another thing that, that Nero did. Uh, Nero fastened the guilt of burning Rome and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class that was hated for their abominations. They were called Christians. Accordingly, an arrest was first made of all who pleaded guilty. And then upon their information, an immense multitude was convicted, not so much of the crime of firing the city, but as having a hatred towards mankind. A mockery of every sort was added to their death. They were covered with the skins of beasts, and they were torn apart by dogs, and they perished, or they were nailed to crosses, or they were doomed to the flames and burnt alive to serve as nightly illumination in Nero's garden. So when you look at the well, fate... Do you, remember, do you remember seeing that in that movie? In the movie? Oh, yeah. Human torches were there, yeah. That's right. Human torches that Nero had put in his garden uh, that they had put throughout Rome, burning the Christians on stakes to light up Rome at night. So with that being your destiny, who could possibly say these I people... Do this because it's not real anyway. Exactly. So I go back to the guy that I quoted at the beginning of our lesson, Edwin Yamuchi. American historian, professor of history at Miami University from 1969 to 2005. And he said, Crucifixion was the most abhorrent fate that anyone could undergo, and the fact that there was a movement based on a crucified Nazarene has to be explained. And the only explanation, the only plausible explanation, is that they literally saw Jesus resurrected from the dead. And they believed it to be so true that they were willing to undergo anything that they had to undergo. Now, I can't, uh, I can't get, <laughs> when you talk about, uh, are you going to believe these guys or are you going to believe some uh, scientist or some teacher or some, some modern person? And m my feeling is some of these modern people aren't even willing to go out to a cup of coffee for what they believe. When you want to have a discussion with someone about the truth of these, they're not even willing to meet you to discuss these things. On the other hand, these people were willing to be torn apart by dogs. They were willing to be burned alive. Uh, they were willing to be crucified. So yeah, I would believe these people before I would believe one of these people. What was there to gain? They didn't get their own episode of Cribs on MTV. <laughs> they didn't build bigger garages for their fancy chariots. What was the motivation? 
You can even look around today. What is the reward for being a Christian in our community? Jesus even promised his followers to count the cost. Because if you choose to follow me, you will have to care, carry your own cross. So that is the historical data on those 50 days in A.D. 30 that a person would have to look at that data and come up with the best explanation, which undoubtedly is the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. 